Hi everyone, this is Andrew Prima, Ukrainian-American, reporting from Kyiv. In today's podcast, week 140 of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and this is the second week of November 2024. In today's podcast, we're going to talk about the Trump's victory and what relationships Ukraine will need to build with the new president of the United States. And we're also going to talk about the relationships of European Union with US, with the new US administration. After Donald Trump's victory in the US presidential election, talks intensified about his promise to end the war in Ukraine within 24 hours. The 24-hour thesis is a campaign strategy, but also demonstrates one important component of Trump's future foreign policy. Its essence is that its essence is that Trump will not follow Biden's sluggish policy, and the action of the 47th U.S. president will be more defined and effective, but at the same time, radical. However, is it a, is it possible for the U.S. as Ukraine's main partner to put an end to the Russian aggression in Ukraine? without radical actions? I think not. Given the fact that Trump and his closest circle have a desire to end the war, Ukraine should play in advance and not wait for it to be faced with the fact of coercion or the need to sign a certain peace treaty with Russia, which will by no means buy victory for our state. And with a high probability, it will allow our enemy to save face while at the same time recording his stay in Ukraine-occupied territories. Therefore, a completely logical question arises as to what Ukraine can offer to Donald Trump so that the U.S. will continue to be a partner of our state, but not a partner of the Biden administration model, but at a higher and more effective level. The main thing to consider is that Trump entered politics from the business world, so he is a businessman, first of all, and a political figure, second. Therefore, communication with him should should take place in a language understandable to a person in the business world. And a person in the business world appreciates not empty talk about democratic values, liberal democracy, and an endless list of reforms that do not give positive results. Trump values facts, results, and potential benefits, considering his interests and strengthening his position in the market, in our case, on the geopolitical map of the world. So here's the conclusion. In negotiations with Donald Trump, you need to be clear, correct, specific, keep your word, and be guided by the facts of objective reality, but not by unreal desires. At the same time, while demonstrating readiness to take into account the interests of the United States, it is necessary to constantly talk about the interests of Ukraine, as well as to form the opinion that a significant part of the interests of America and Ukraine coincide, and therefore Washington and Kyiv have a common interest. This common interest is to prevent Russia from winning. Putin should not feel like a winner because a victory in Ukraine creates a risk for further aggression toward the West. Not realizing this today means losing a part of the Europe tomorrow. Does Donald Trump want it? Definitely not. In addition, Russia's victory is a signal for other authoritarian regimes. China may step up the aggression against Taiwan, North Korea toward South Korea, Arab dictatorship of the Middle East toward Israel. Trump doesn't have the right to allow a domino effect, which is highly likely to become a reality if the Kremlin wins in Ukraine. Another point that Zelensky and Trump have in common is that they have tons of experience in the media sphere. Trump has long realized the role of the media in modern life in 2004, 2004, launching the reality show The 
uh, Apprentice and The Candidate. This show brought Donald Trump to a new level of recognition, making him famous in different countries of the world. That is why the president of Ukraine must understand the importance of Trump, for Trump of improving his own image, not only in the U.S., but also on the world stage. The end of the war, taking into account the interests of Ukraine, will be a victory for Trump, because he will become the person who was able to defeat the authoritarian aggression of the new emperor that Putin imagined himself to be. Speaking about the potential benefits that America can get from Ukraine, we should focus on several essential areas. First, there are the rare earth and non-ferrous metals that Ukraine has in its surface. In the ground, we're talking about tantalum, zirconium, rare earth ores, and beryllium. Lithium reserves in Ukraine are the largest in Europe. In addition, you need to remember about the iron ore and the huge deposits that Ukraine has. All this allows Ukraine officials to talk about the export of these metals to the United States, but only under the condition of the creation of joint high-tech and industrial enterprises on the territory of Ukraine, preferably in the areas near the front line. If Trump is determined to stop the war on the existing front line, there should be big projects in which America will invest and definitely make lots of money. Secondly, we should offer Donald Trump to participate in the reconstruction of Ukraine. We are talking about the involvement of American construction companies, including Trump's own companies, which will not only be engaged in uh, construction, but will also be able to buy or receive from the state of Ukraine or private owners under special conditions the object destroyed by the Russian invaders. So, for example, the Kharkiv Palace Hotel can change its name to Trump's Palace. Donald Trump is interested in what he understands. And the field of construction is the, uh, is the world that brought him into the great politics. The third point concerns Ukraine's membership in NATO. For Ukrainians, this is a very painful moment because we all want to join the North Atlantic Alliance. But reality stubbornly shows us that no one will take us there. And he won't take it, even when the war is over. And that's why we have to look for an alternative to NATO. Such an alternative might take the form of the status of the main U.S. ally outside of NATO. As of today, 18 countries and Taiwan de facto have this status, giving Ukraine the status of the main U.S. ally outside of NATO, can guarantee the security of our country from further Russian aggression and relieve tensions among NATO members' countries that do not want our country to join the North Atlantic Alliance. Will Trump go for it? With the proper work of the Ukrainian authorities, with Trump himself and his closest entourage, we can get such a status already in the first month after the inauguration of the 47th President of the United States. Ukraine must realize that in today's world it is impossible to demand and ask all the time. It is necessary to propose and find common interests and opportunities for the practical implementation of such interests. Without understanding this, we risk ceasing to be interesting to the civilized world. And whoever is not interested in the civilized world, a priori, falls into the world of barbarism with which Ukraine has been waging a bloody and brutal war for the third year, defending its own right to freedom and life. So last week, European countries gathered in Budapest for the emergency summit of the European Union dedicated to Donald Trump victory. Hungary Prime Minister is not the only one who regularly meets privately with Trump, and it's the only one that Trump enthusiastically talks about the communicating with at election rallies because, in his idea of Europe, it should be with Orban's face. The return of the former head of the United States to the White House will also have to be reacted 
to because this return means a real triumph of Trumpism as a new ideology of the American right. And in this ideology of Euro-Atlantic solidarity and common democratic values, there is not much room left. The confrontation between dem democracies and dictatorships, which determine our future, took on a new dimension on November 5th. They are democracies. They are dictatorships. The Europeans have two options in this situation. The first is to realize the dimin diminishing role of the U.S. as the main power of the democratic world and the guarantor of the security of post-war Europe and to think about its independent role. Many politicians of the continent are already talking about this. Polish Foreign Minister Radoslav Sikorski called on Europeans to take greater responsibility for their own security. French European Affairs Minister Benjamin Haddad urged Europeans to recognize that they can no longer depend on the whims of American policy and called for more serious European defense cooperation. The end of history has come to an end, the French minister said sarcastically. And of course, it's not only Orban. It is enough just to look at the post of the leaders of far-right politician parties on social networks to understand what kind of holiday and what premonition of victory is on the street today. The far right has already strengthened its role both in the European Parliament and the international parliaments. They, as in the Netherlands, Austria or Italy, become the first parties in election from governments and had parliaments. Even before Trump's victory, it was possible to talk about the growth of their role, but now that one of them triumphantly, and this is a triumphant victory, won the elections in the United States. They hope that the Europe voter, frightened by the divorce from America, will carry them in his arms to the government offices. In addition, far-right Politicians can not only please Trump, but also do what traditional liberals or conservatives are not ready to do. They can negotiate with dictator Putin. So, as you know already, Trump has never been a big fan of today's Europe. I always believe that it is lives at, at the expense of the United States, both in the security and social sense. He will continue to educate the Europeans and say, if you want the support of the Americans, in particular security, try to do more. Achieve such results that will be visible and accepted by everyone. But now, I think the Europeans are facing a very difficult dilemma, as Trump will demand support for, the, for his course on China. And not only China, but the Middle East. It causes hysteria among many Europeans. But Trump will also require the Europeans to get more involved in, in us, in, involved in Ukraine, and pay more for security and recovery in Ukraine, for which the Europeans are largely unprepared. I don't think they are panicking because they were preparing for Trump, but I think there will be more than one hysteria in Europe. To be honest, Europe needs a stress test, perhaps in the form of Trump. Europe must finally understand the wake up that it needs to get out of the warm bath. And the Kremlin will try to do everything possible and impossible to leave us outside of the European Union, us Ukrainians. We have a very emotional, very vulnerable society in this sense, and any betrayals will spread like wildfire. Therefore, we must understand that for Ukraine, the question of joining the European Union is a question of our existence as a country and a nation. Especially now, with Donald Trump in power, the issue of our joining NATO will be very difficult. At least that's what I can conclude from conversations with those in Trump circles, with whom people constantly communicate and exchange ideas. The current state of Europe is certainly not catastrophic, but it's very difficult. We have no idea who will be in Donald Trump's cabinet. 
he's the only one who has the answer to this question. There are no other real, reliable sources today. Some people are responsible for res, res, restarting the government. They have made their plans for the next month. They are short lists for all key positions, but they are conditional and discussed specifically with the future US President Donald Trump. Today, Trump is a person who has maximum charisma and, after this election, a mandate for formation. They will walk in circles around him. Nevertheless, the people whom he perceives well are well known to us with whom he constantly communicates, at least in security and foreign policy matters. Most of these people will find themselves in positions in the White House, the Senate, the State Department, Pentagon, and CIA, etc. But it is unlikely that these will be fundamentally different people with whom Trump has not worked and has no human touch. Some Republicans say he is irrational irrational as of today no one can say who and how and who will appoint to conduct these matters particularly foreign policy so in my opinion under trump ukraine as a nation and as a state will have much greater risk but much greater chances and opportunities what we have left we have two months before the Donald Trump inauguration, and the only thing we can do, just wait and build a better relationships with the U.S. government. Thank you for listening. If you like my podcast, please share with your friends.